Welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, an exploration of the idea of curiosity and its increasing importance for thriving in the digital age from the authors of The Curious Advantage. Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Curious Advantage podcast. This series is about how individuals and organizations use the power of curiosity to drive success in their lives and organizations, especially in the context of our new digital reality. It brings to life the latest understandings from neuroscience, anthropology, history, and behaviorism about curiosity and makes these useful for everyone. My name is Garrick Jones, and I'm one of the co-authors of the book, The Curious Advantage. And today I'm here with my co-author, Simon Brown. Hi, everyone. And we are delighted to be joined by Chris Meyer. Hi, Garrick. Hi, Simon. Chris's mission is to anticipate and shape the future of business. And he's a thought leader focusing on the information economy, globalization, and business innovation. Chris has a business called Got Nerve. He facilitates some of the world's leading think tanks, and he advises the boards of some of the most well-known organizations on the planet. He's also the author of four books. And as Seth Godin says of Chris, he is insightful in his analysis, challenging of the status quo and ahead of his time. Chris, I've had the pleasure of working together with you for many years, from the time you led the Center for Business Innovation in Cambridge, Massachusetts, through to the publication of your incredible book, Blur, which predicted many of the specific impacts of the internet on business, and working for the last 16 years together, supporting you in the Future Trends Forum think tank, a think tank that's been awarded foremost technology think tank in Europe many times. Thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. It's a favorite subject. I'm happy to be here. So I guess to kick us off, uh, we're really interested in your views around curiosity. And with a, an amazing repertoire of things you've done in the past, you're obviously a very curious person and your career is focused around being curious around trends and where the future is going, and the impact of technology on the world. So really curious to get your own view on the importance of curiosity. I think curiosity is almost like having another sense. It's about sensing the parts of the world you can't see, the assumptions, as well as what the future is going to be. So it's the difference really between taking what you see as received wisdom and assuming it's going to be the same and wondering how else it might be. And I guess in particular, certainly in the, in the business context, that translates into how it might be in the future. But it's also how it might be if something were different. The U.S. hockey star Bobby Orr is famous for having said, uh, I don't go to where the puck is, I go to where the puck will be. And that's kind of a statement about how important it is to know what the current trends may do in the future, except his statement is in three dimensions, two spatial dimensions and a time dimension. In the real world, there's an unlimited number of dimensions interacting all the time. And to me, curiosity is about understanding which of those interactions are going to change the world as we see it. Chris, the idea of dimensionality, all these possible futures, and going to where the puck will be rather than where it is, how do you stimulate that in the groups you work with? An important technique is to enlarge the frame. So if a group is saying, this is the way our business runs, these are who our customers are, these are our economics, you can say, is that true everywhere? Or has that always been true? Or what could change to make those things different? And often it's kind of like a science fiction writer who picks a premise to be different. You know, let's, let's set this story on the moon. So gravity is 20% what it is here. Then how do you build things differently? So what if interest rates were going to be zero for 15 years, as uh, seems likely? Are you ready for that assumption? So that sounds pretty prosaic, but I don't think curiosity is magic. It is a systematic approach. It may come more naturally to some people than others, but it's a systematic approach of saying, what are the assumptions that our view of the way things work are based on? And what if they weren't true? And what does that teach us about what's possible? Is there a particular model or a particular technique that you use in coming up with those sort of future scenarios? There is a model. In the 90s, I got very interested in what are called complex adaptive systems or complexity theory. And complexity is about the idea that the most inventive process we know is nature. Nature is produced everything we see. And I don't just mean biological nature. I include physics. So we start out with a big bang and now we have a big Mac. 
<laughs> was, um, <laughs> and so how did that happen? The way complexity theory works is it takes the record of nature and abstracts it into a mathematical system. And then you can start applying those mathematics to elements of the real world, like organizations or markets or societies. So what are a couple of features of how nature finds solutions? The first one is the distinction between uh, so-called exploration and exploitation. So if you're an anthill and you're uh, next to half an old Big Mac, you have a lot of your ants going out and uh, harvesting food from that source. Then something happens. There's a, there's a rainstorm. It washes the food source away. What happens in the anthill? The anthill somehow decides to move a lot of its resources, these ants that were going out and harvesting pieces of the Big Mac, from exploiting that food source to exploring for a new one. So, so the individual insects actually change their roles and their behaviors from going back and forth from the food source to wandering around looking for something new. And it's interesting when you think about what typically organizations do, they do the opposite. The economy takes a downturn and an organization says, we need to get back to basics. We need to hunker down. We need to do what got us here. And that's equivalent to returning to where the Big Mac was, but there's nothing there anymore, as opposed to saying, we need to devote more resources to figuring out where our next income is coming from. When the environment changes, you need to understand that that means your exploitation opportunities may have been reduced and you'd better explore to increase your potential options. And is that where curiosity then plays its role that while you're eating that discarded Big Mac, actually you should be already curious as to where your Big Mac, next Big Mac is coming from um, and curiosity gets you prepared to, uh, to know what happens in the event it washes away? Well, precisely. And, you know, if you were a petrostate, for example, wouldn't this have been a pretty apparent opportunity? I forget who it is who said the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones and the oil economy isn't ending because we've run out of oil either. Let's just say you were a state with a lot of sunshine and a lot of cash. Mightn't you have wanted to figure out how to fund the growth of the solar industry, become the research center of the world for solar energy. And if you were the UAE or Saudi, you had that opportunity. They even had the sand for the silicon, so it <laughs> could have been vertically integrated. You're talking about going to where the puck is going to be then. Well, exactly. Back to Simon's question, is that what curi what's the difference between curiosity and planning? Right. So what I've just described could have been done with, say, scenario planning. And I want to come back to another model from nature. But when I ran a think tank, we used to talk about Asimov moments. And that was named after Isaac Asimov. And the reason for this was that he said the most powerful moment in science isn't when you say Eureka. It's when somebody looks at something and says, gee, that's funny, because that's the beginning of a new question. So there's a difference between solving a problem and you could say, okay, I'm a petrostate. I have a problem. The world isn't going to use oil forever. That's my economy. What am I going to do about it? That might not be called curiosity, but you might need curious people to find the solution to it. So someday you'll get to Eureka, but the gee, that's funny is when you see Germany creating feed-in tariffs so that people can put solar panels on their houses, even if it's not yet economic to do so. That's when you start a plan. Asimov used to talk when he made this point about the discovery of penicillin. And when Alexander Fleming in, I think it's 1928, looks at a Petri dish and sees that the bacteria have stopped growing in part of it, that's when he says, gee, that's funny. He wasn't looking for an antibiotic, but something triggered in his mind that he became curious about. In a hockey game, there's only so many places the puck can go. But in the complex world that we live in today, there are, there are so many variables, so many scenarios. How do you decide what to be curious about and where to, where to channel your energy? 
in the hockey game, all you're trying to do is get the puck in the goal, right? <laughs> in the world, you don't really know what you're trying to do necessarily. So you might ask, is nature curious? And I'd say, no, nature just going about its business. But the way it goes about its business has allowed life to inhabit every niche you can think of, right? You go to the bottom of the sea at the hot undersea vents, and there's the Archaea kingdom. You go to high altitudes and freezing cold, and you find these frozen things that just wake up in the, in the summer. So how did nature become so good at expanding life? And the answer is a pretty clear system. And here's where working out the mathematics of evolution come in. Three features of evolution, speaking very broadly, are diversity of inputs, uh, recombination of genes, which we'll call ideas, and selection, sorting out which of those recombinant novelties are of value. The way this works is that so how does nature do this? It has two sources of diversity, and one is just called mutation, where things change at random, where the, the idea, uh, we'll call it the meme, which perhaps people know is a word coined by the biologist uh, Richard Dawkins to be equivalent to genes. And he, by that, he means ideas that can be transmitted culturally the way genetic ideas are, com are transmitted via reproduction. Uh, so nature takes what it has and it mutates it to introduce a randomly different version of what's there. And it also invents these ways of recombining ideas in a glass full of bacteria. DNA fragments circulate kind of freely and get incorporated in new uh, in other bacteria. And of course, in mammals, we have sex to recombine our genetic ideas. So you can see that in a conversation, you can have the same story. You invite a diverse set of people who bring different memes to your conversation. But Chris, this is fascinating because what I've seen when I've worked with you over the years is your understanding of complex dynamic systems and how you apply this idea of evolution to knowledge formation and the synthesis of knowledge within a group of people or, or a system of people who are working on things together. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you apply this evolutionary approach to knowledge formation? Sure. The first thing is to invite the right set of people. You invite diverse people who have enough in common to be able to talk to one another and enough motivation in common to want to listen to each other. And you give them a structured set of tasks to elicit their sharing of ideas. And that's the recombinant process like breeding in mammals. And then when you have that set of ideas, you have another, another part of the process, which is selection. The group as a whole is like the environment for a new mutation or a new creature. And that creature may do well in that environment or it may not. And Simon, this is where we get back to your question, because in practice, that group has a purpose, like the goal on the hockey rink. And that purpose uh -huh. is articulate what the food system is going to look like 15 years from now. And so the group collectively says, well, we got 40 ideas out of this conversation and we like these three. So let's assume that high yield plants and an infrastructure that supports smallholders in Africa and continued global supply chains those are three ideas we want to build in our scenario of the future. And let's go on from there and have another generation of conversation to evolve what comes next. So it's a very specific set of methods for uh, creating and guiding a conversation. You're listening to The Curious Advantage podcast, inspired by the book, The Curious Advantage, written by Paul Ashcroft, Simon Brown, and Garrick Jones. Subscribe to the podcast today. In nature and evolution, I guess that takes place over millions of years. But in a corporate or business context, we don't have those millions of years. We don't have you know, many different anthills that can die out because they didn't go off and uh, and explore. So what, what's the role of sort of experimentation and um, acceptance of failure more in a, in a 
corporate world, I guess, to uh, be able to do this much faster than is permitted within nature. Well, this was part of Richard Dawkins' point in talking about memes, that memes evolve at the speed of cultural evolution rather than biological evolution. So then the question becomes, what is the speed of cultural evolution in your organization? How fast can people change their minds? How fast can the group evolve? So this has to do with open-mindedness. It has to do with uh, what's reinforced. You know, there's an old story about Capital One back in its uh, day of really rapid growth. And what they did was, uh, as, as Google famously did uh, more than a decade later, was give their smart people a certain amount of time to work on projects of their own devising. And then if they came up with something, it got filtered. So that's a selection pressure. You let the diverse group come up with a diverse set of ideas. Um, anyway, you, uh, and, and, and if you have a, a good seed, somebody will water it for you. That is, you, there, was a, there was a marketplace in senior management attention for the junior people's ideas. And there was a, a, one, of the, one of the pieces of lore there was um, some guy had a great idea and he worked on it for three months and he found out actually it wasn't going to work. And so he killed his project. The CEO of Capital One put him up on stage at the all hands meeting that they had monthly at the time and said, you know, congratulations, Simon, you have helped us by killing off your project. It seemed promising. You did the work and now you have the guts to say to us all bad idea. And so there are little things a, an organization can do to say ideation is good, experimentation is good, and by the way, plenty of experiments fail. A VC I knew said, you know, the problem with big companies is they take really juicy, high-risk, high-return opportunities, and then they manage all the risk out of them until there's no <laughs> return left. <laughs> and I think this is, uh, you know, if corporations took more of the view that only one in 10 things uh, succeeds, and if you, you're, you're no less successful a manager if you just ran through three failures because you hadn't gotten to your big success yet, that's the way we run the company. We found that with Novartis, certainly in looking for what are those symbols that can really help in the culture change and yeah, being able to point to the stories or the symbols can move you very or much more rapidly, I guess, in getting to that state that you want to be. Yeah. And this brings us back to the explore exploit dichotomy, because in exploitation, one in 10 isn't very good right? Yeah. We already know where the Big Mac is. Don't tell me you went out and came back empty handed, right? The metrics for our exploitation. So recognizing that you have these two things going on at once is important. But in today's world, what's happening is we are, just as we did in the, in the industrial revolution, we are automating a huge part of the exploitation. We automated the physical part. Now we're automating a lot of the marketing part, a lot of the, of the um, even some of the ideation part. So if bots are going to do a lot of the human work, certainly the administrative work, then those metrics which evaluate exploration become appropriate for a much larger part of the organization. So you have like a figure ground reversal. When I went to business school in the 20th century, it was all about efficient exploitation. So everything is better supply chain, you know, better, uh, more targeted marketing, better market segmentation, finer and finer tolerances, fewer and fewer failures. Now we're in the world with information robots uh, that are, you know, managing our electrical networks, managing our supply chain, managing all these exploitation tasks. So we need organizations that are much more focused on being good at exploring. And that's why curiosity is central to success going forward. It's interesting. We, we were talking to Vas Narasimhan, the Novartis CEO, um, on one of these podcasts recently, and he, he talked about curiosity uh, in the context of becoming explorers, that if, if um, we can encourage people to be curious and to explore, then that will unlock the innovation, that will unlock the ideas. So that uh, aligns very well with what you were just describing. Companies have developed learning journeys. They've de given people sabbaticals. It does seem to me that getting people 
out of the world in which momentum rules, because tomorrow is so much like today, and putting them in a place farther away so they think new thoughts is a useful component of any corporate curiosity amplification program, if you like. Changing the context and taking a bigger view of the one that you're inhabiting. Do you know the work of Lisa Bodell? She's written a fantastic book called Kill the Company, mm. which is really about taking the most extreme scenario you can imagine and working with that as one of the ways to figure out partially where the future might lie. When you talk about the evolutionary approach to knowledge formation and how that might impact the system of the organization. I was interested when you're talking about selection pressure, take all the recombination, but you subject them to the selection pressure and the constraints in order for to allow these things to move forward. How does that work in reality, Chris? To stick with nature, there's a mammal strategy of reproduction and there's a mollusk strategy of reproduction. And a mammal has a small number of live births that are extremely taxing on the parents to take care of and nurture and try to bring to maturity. And the mollusks just send out a million spores and a lot fall on stony ground, but a lot, you know, light somewhere new in a new environment where they can take root. I would argue that historically pharmaceuticals have been pretty mammalian in this respect. You had 12 years to come through an entire research cycle to get to a specific result. And so now we actually have some technologies lying around that help, like high throughput screening and simulation. But I would guess they've only made small inroads into the approaches, the research approaches of big pharma. And suddenly the Big Mac went away. We have this emergency. It's almost money is no object, but just get this done. And so we have people sharing data. The whole medical community is sharing data about what works. And so different combinations of drugs or the different uses of ventilators or whatever are being shared around the world in, you know, in a lightning flash. And treatment is actually getting better every month. The mortality improves. Similarly, you have you know, these different approaches to vaccines, high throughput screening of existing drugs and simulations and messenger RNA based techniques, all of which were often niches suddenly being uh, flogged for all they're worth. And in one case, a drug company talking about a business model that says, if we find this thing and it works, we're just going to license it, not quite open source, but we're going to license it to anyone who can make it. So we get the billions of doses to billions of people as fast as possible. We'll sort the business model out after the emergency is solved. So the emergency, the extreme scenario has spawned a much more experimental, higher diversity approach to finding an answer. So let's back away then from the extreme scenario and say, is there a way that we might adopt that point of view all the time? Alf Bingham, who used to run the, uh, the corporate R&D at Eli Lilly, developed a technique that helped Lilly take a little more of this perspective. And it was to treat every proposal, every research proposal as an option, a financial option. In principle, each idea has a present value, right? Has a valuation in a market. They started looking at their drug development portfolio as a portfolio of options. And every new piece of data, every toxicity test or every result of a trial was something that, that changed the valuation of that option. So it's as if each of their internal drug development programs was some little startup being analyzed by analysts and, and their valuations changed all the time. And I mentioned this as a corporate mechanism for expanding the willingness to, uh, to explore. A curious culture is a game changer. What does curiosity mean for you? Follow hashtag curious advantage and join the conversation. So, Chris, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about Elf Bingham because he's been involved in a company called Innocentive, I think, since he's been at Eli Lilly, which has taken an evolutionary biological approach to the market in, in as much as they set up as, as many competitions as they can, as far as I understand it, between anybody who has a laboratory and they're all going after the, the major problems that need solving. Is that right? 
ALF founded Innocentive, and it was supported initially by both Lilly and Procter and & Gamble. And the idea was that the solutions to some challenging problems, in particular that start out with research problems, could be found outside of the companies that had the problems. So Innocentive created a platform for what they called seekers and solvers. And seekers said, okay, I need to make this molecule, it could be a drug, it could be a detergent. I need to make this molecule. And here are the four inputs that I use to make this molecule. It takes me seven chemical reactions to get there. Can somebody find me a way to do this more efficiently, less expensively? Let's say Lily would be the seeker, but then they opened the platform so anybody could be the seeker. Uh, Novartis could be the seeker or Dunkin' Donuts could be the speaker since we're in junk food land today. The challenge is put out to the population of solvers. And it might turn out that somebody working on food preservatives in South Korea had just worked on an adjacent problem. And so he submits a proposed solution. And if the seeker accepts the solution, he gets the reward. The seeker would have put a reward, you know, this is $50,000 if you can solve this problem. So he's applying sort of evolutionary approaches to solving the problems on a, a macro scale. Correct. By accessing the diversity of all of the interested chemical engineers in the world, not just the thousand who might work for Lilly. From all of those things that you're looking at, what are you currently most curious about? So where are you focusing your curiosity at the moment? What kind of behavioral interventions are possible to help people better appreciate their common interests? When Barack Obama was president, he caused a furor in the entrepreneurial community when he said, you know, you created this great startup, but don't think you built that all by yourself, right? There was, you know, all of this established infrastructure. There was a rule of law. There were courts. There were contracts. There was, there were libraries. There's, you know, everything. There were roads. You know, there's everything it took on top of which you can operate. And that didn't get there by magic. It got there by people building and investing a set of common assets that we could all benefit from. What will it take to get people to see that what each of us is doing is just the icing on an enormously high cake? If we start eroding that, then we're not going to be able to do much of anything. So Chris, you've been at the forefront of all of these trends. You've been looking at where the puck maybe going um, for the, you know more than 20 years. I don't want to give away your age. And how different is the world today from where you thought it might go? Because I know in your book, Blur, you outlined what the impact of um, the internet could be on the organization. And some of that is freakishly you know, prescient. How different is the world we're inhabiting today? Each chapter of the book, honestly, has proven correct. Here's what we missed. We did not foresee social media at all. A later thing we didn't really get was what AI was going to be like. So AI, I think we can be uh, excused for uh, because it was quite a while before it's made any difference. Social media, the, our excuse would be that nobody forecast it. Nobody understood what a force it was going to become, but we totally missed it. You know, and, and back to behavioral interventions, the idea ecology and the personality ecology that social media has become, and therefore the political tool that it's become, we didn't have a clue. So Chris, as we bring things to a close, if you wanted our listeners to take one thing away from today's podcast, uh, what would be the, the one message that you'd want them to hear? It's a great moment to make this point because we have an instance where we're understanding that we exploited supply chain techniques and technology to create this incredibly efficient supply chain, but was also incredibly brittle. And so we're moving toward a more robust model where if you pull back and say, it's not the unit cost today, 
It's what happens to the average cost when you take into account there are going to be tornadoes or pandemics or other things that are disruptive. And the payback for having resiliency comes in a longer term. So what does that have to do with curiosity? Having diverse people in an organization stopping the conversation and saying, wait, you're assuming that Chinese wages are always going to be the lowest. Let's say this was 10 years ago. What if wages rose in China? And the tendency of the conversation 10 years ago would be to say, do you know how many Chinese people there are in the labor force? What are you talking about? But having that conversation, entertaining the extreme scenario, is expensive in time. It takes more people to have that organization. It's frustrating to deal with people whose first language isn't your own. It's frustrating to deal with people 12 time zones away. So there are costs to building curiosity into your organization and way of doing business. And the, and, the, and the return to those costs is not immediately apparent. It's not the most narrowly efficient, but a curious organization is more robust and has more potential for growth. Chris, as always, talking with you is absolutely fascinating. You cover a huge amount of ground from the macro to the micro. We've talked about the evolution of knowledge. We've talked about trends and forecasting scenarios, exploitation and exploration, the intangible economy. We've talked about the circular economy and moving towards robust economies in the, in the current situation. We talked about curious organizations and most importantly, perhaps the diversity that's required to ensure robust communities going forward. I want to thank you so much for joining us. It's been absolutely fascinating. It's been a pleasure to roam around this territory with you two. Thanks so much, Chris. You've been listening to a Curious Advantage podcast. Keep exploring curiously. See you next time. Thank you for listening to the Curious Advantage podcast. The Curious Advantage book is now available to purchase on Amazon. Subscribe to the podcast today. Follow hashtag Curious Advantage and join the conversation. This podcast is produced by Aliki Palinelli and John McGinty and edited by Jill Damatak-Futter. 